fallen off my roller skates and you know, I thought that that was why my back hurt, but it turns out that Parkinson's can really make your back hurt. <laughs> so. Well, what's the worst thing about the disease for you? Well, trying to figure out, somebody said it's like Mr. Toad's wild ride, and it sort of is. You wake up in the morning, you just don't know what in the heck's going to happen. Like, there, I take a certain kind of medicine. I don't take any of the pharmaceutical drugs for it yet because I don't like them. I get bad side effects, but... I'm taking a certain kind of medicine, a natural medicine, and it wears off after about three hours, and you just never, like right now it's wearing off, <laughs> so I can't think. And, um, it, you know, you just kind of stiffen up and you start shaking a little bit. It's just, that's, it's the hardest thing is to try to decide what time to take it and figure out what you're going to do, how to plan my day. I have to plan it with Parkinson's in mind. You're known as a, as a brave person, certainly a brave performer. But when you sit down for an interview such as this, a lengthy interview, is there fear that, well, by the time we get three quarters through the interview, if it runs long, that you may not be at or near your best? Well, I never know what's going to happen to my brain. I used to have a really good memory, you know, and I could just read something and I could just give it back to you verbatim. My dad had a great memory. My grandpa had a great memory. But with Parkinson's, my memory is not so good. <laughs> So I'll struggle for things like a name or, or I struggle for a word, you know, and that really bothers me because I, I, lo I love words and I love to describe things cleanly and I like to like to play with words, but sometimes they just run away and hide and I can't find them. What, do you sing at all now? Do you sing yourself in the shower? I don't sing in the shower. That's how I knew I couldn't sing because I used to always sing. You know, I would sing in the car and I would sing walking down the street and I was singing in the shower. And... I did a lot of internal singing, like little tiny singing that you wouldn't even be able to hear, but I would, mm -hmm. and I don't even do that anymore because I just don't have those colors. I don't have any colors in my paint box. But what a paint box it was. At her height, Linda Ronstadt was known as a very special musician whose voice was her instrument. She sang with texture and power in platinum hits like Blue Bio. who you are. Yes, everybody knows who Linda Ronson is. Superstar, one of the creative legends of California-style country rock, whatever you want to call it. But who are you? Well, in terms of singing, I've just always considered myself basically a soprano. You know, I, I, I sang a lot of different stuff, and I've never thought that I made, you know, the most important stamp on pop music or anything like that. But what I did that was different from other people, I think, was that I sang a, a very diverse uh, range of music. And it wasn't arbitrary that I, the, the reasons that I did that were, were not arbitrary. They were very deliberate. And they have a footing in my childhood. I, I always say that I never sang any style of music that I hadn't heard in my household growing up before I was the age of 10. I've talked to visual artists that say if they didn't know horses, for instance, when they were a child growing up, they don't try to draw them. And I feel that way about music. If I haven't heard it when I was a little child, I can't approach it with any kind of authenticity. You've, you've said and you've written that you were shy as, as a child. Terribly, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, you know, it's, I think it's a, natural, it's a natural thing for animals to uh, not like to be stared at. And because um, often in the animal kingdom, if someone's staring at you, they want to eat you. <laughs> so I think I just uh, went along with nature in that way. I remember when I was a little girl, I was always hiding behind my mother's legs. And it was very hard uh, to become a performer because I loved to sing and I loved to rehearse. But getting on stage meant everybody was looking at you. <laughs> so I just look at my feet. So people ask me about different times of the different periods of music. And I can usually remember what kind of shoes I was wearing. You know, because I was looking at my feet. <laughs> well, how did you overcome the shyness? I didn't. You know, I just, it just was with me my whole life. You know, I try to compensate for, I try to pretend I wasn't shy by acting bold or by acting stupid. I don't know. But um, I, I wasn't ever, ever able to really get rid of it. I, to this day, I really don't like a, a big group of people. I like a quiet conversation. My idea of a, of a great dinner party is, 20 people who have, or 10 people who have known each other for at least 20 years. No strangers, you know. Well, one reason I wanted to ask you that question is I envision 
any number of people who may be watching this interview who have a child or some other relative or know somebody who's very talented but also very shy. Could you give them a piece of advice? Or well, I think it's hardwired. Um, my father was fairly shy and he was very quiet. I'm shy and noisy. You know, I don't know how that worked out. But um, I think it's, it's hardwired and I think you just have to respect that in people and give them some room for it, you know? Later on, you get successful. You become one of the most successful performers, not just in this country, but in the entire world. Now, you said in a recent interview, you talked a little bit about living the wildlife at the height of your career. Was there I didn't live a very wild life. <laughs> What's well, going on around me, but I wasn't, you know, much of a participant. Well, I want to follow on that. Was there a time when you were swept up in drugs, partying, steamy relationships, and so forth? <laughs> I don't know about the steamy relationships. I wasn't much of a partier. I, what I really like to do, and I, and I never liked drugs, I have to say. I tried everything. Well, I didn't try everything. I tried several drugs. I didn't try injectables. I wasn't interested in psychedelics. And if I did cocaine, it just made me really nervous. You know, it made my nose bleed. So I thought, well, why do I need this? But some people like it. I don't know why. You were traveling, correct me if I'm wrong, at one point, mostly with males. This I is was. what rock bands were. What was that like? How did you handle that? Well, I swore a lot. I started swearing a lot. <laughs> I was very happy when I could finally afford to hire some woman to go with me, you know, to help me sort of pack and unpack and put on makeup and do girl things. But um, I don't know. I, I was lucky. I had a lot of smart guys in my band. They were smart. They were readers. They were well-educated. They were funny. They were nice, you know. But men on the road are men on the road. They're men on the road. They're always on the hunt. You know, they're always out looking for that elusive woman. But, um, you know, what we mainly did was we'd go into each other's rooms and play music. Musicians are playing music all the time. A professional musician is probably going to, you know, a guitar player is going to have his guitar in his, his hand probably eight hours out of 24 every day. And that's how they get really good. And how you know a musician is they can't put that guitar down. It's not like they have to practice. It's not like they have to make themselves go pick the guitar up and practice. That's not going to be somebody who's ever going to turn out to be a professional professional guy is going to be the one that you can't get, you can't pry that guitar out of his hand. You know, you can't get it away from him. He's just playing it all the time. Well, sort of candidly put, bluntly put, how do you keep these guys off of you? Or did you? Oh, well, <laughs> that's kind of a silly question. It's a really good idea not to mess around with anybody in the band. You know, that's kind of rule number one. It's a funny thing, but there's a, there's a scene, uh, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. I don't know if you read that. But it's a wonderful uh, opening where they talk about how provincial the life of sailors really, really is because they're on the boat, they're on the the boat all the time, which was like the bus for us. So they only see each other, and we we kind of were like that, you know. We had this little group dynamic that would start, and we we just knew about our own little issues. We'd go to Chicago or Detroit or Memphis or wherever we'd go. There would be different places, but we'd stay pretty much the same, keep our own company. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody use that metaphor before, although it strikes me as apt that when you're traveling with a band, you know, first one place and another, it's not really like being a sailor. It really is. It's the same thing, you know. That when you're on the bus, let's say. Different kind of tattoos. That you're, you're <laughs> sailing along the highway, but then you, you reach a port, and yeah. it's sort of like sailors coming into port. You go looking for chicks and grog. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I was not looking for chicks and grog. Love will when we come back, take things in stride. More of Linda Ronstadt's unusual musical journey. Sounds like good advice. 